Hello, you're welcome to The Big Tech Show with me, Adrian Weckler. Now, do you know what Web 3 is? Do you know what Web 1 or Web 2 is, for that matter? Is it just another bit of internet hype to you, or can you identify with tangible, everyday products and services? And do any of them not rhyme with crypto? Well, here to demystify Web3 for us is Alex Tapscott, investor and author of the book Web3, Charting the Internet's Next Economic and Cultural Frontier. Alex, you're very welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, Alex, I'm conscious that terms like Web3, decentralization, blockchain, token-based economics, while you and I might you know, chat about this gaily over lunch, over a really nice lunch with a nice Chianti, it, it is still double Dutch to a lot of people. Can you explain to me what Web3 is and explain it to me like I'm somebody who knows how to use an iPhone, knows how to get around Netflix, but maybe has never coded in my life? Sure. Yeah. Well, um, where, where to begin? So I think that it's helpful to just sort of take a step back and look at what's happening in the world today. So every once in a while, a new technology emerges that transforms the economy and, and uh, the old order of human affairs and in some profound and unexpected ways. And we've seen that play out in the past with technologies that everyone remembers and understands, right? Things like the computer <laughs> or the internet itself or the radio or, or the TV. And now we're in this really interesting period where there's not one, but four new technologies all emerging at around the same time. And, or, or if not emerging, they're all sort of hitting their stride. So the first of these is a technology uh, known as blockchain. So to your point, you know, blockchain is not exactly sonorous, doesn't really roll off the tongue. And it's something that I think a lot of people are still confused about. But basically, you can think of blockchain uh, technology as simply a way to move value peer to peer over the internet, and a way to automate uh, complex business processes that normally would have involved intermediaries like, say, banks. So in the same way that the first era of the internet transformed how we move information online, blockchains transform how we move value online. The second technology is AI, artificial intelligence, which uh, I think a lot of people now understand because of the success of um, applications like ChatGPT. ChatGPT used these things called large language models, which basically allow us to really reimagine what we thought computers could do, um, but also what I think we thought people could do when, when empowered with this new toolkit. The third technology is um, extended reality. So this would be things like virtual reality and augmented reality. And the idea here is simply that for 30 years, the internet's been two-dimensional. And what extended reality promises is to make the web three-dimensional or spatial, to turn it into part of our natural world. And then the fourth technology is the internet of things. Basically, the idea that in the not-so-distant future, there will be many times more uh, connected devices than people. And these devices will do a lot more than, you know, mo monitor our glucose levels or, or maintain our the temperature in our house. They will, they will be thinking um, machines that can do transactions. So, so all of these, this is the context for this conversation. And I know it's a big wind up, but basically the, the point that I want to make is that these technologies are not separate, but related, you know, in the same way that the term internet went from describing a pretty narrow set of networking technologies in the early days, um, words that maybe the version of you and I would have chatted about gaily over a Chianti in 1991. <laughs> um, it went from describing this sort of narrow set of arcane technologies to describing a whole range of technologies, but also business models and social behavior and other phenomena. Um, and I think the same is true for Web3. Um, I think Web3 uh, describes the convergence of all of these different technologies coming together. And I'm happy to explain how that works, but I think that's a good way to level set the conversation. When we think about Web3 companies, if you Google Web3 startups, the vast majority of the stuff you come back with, you end up in the world of crypto. Um, you end up with companies like you know, uh, Binance or Ripple or Gemini or Consensus. Are there other things that we're missing here, other use cases for Web3 technology in any of those areas? Now, I'm, I'm going to leave Internet of Things to one side because I kind of feel that's been around for a few years. And I kind of feel that most people probably have quite a few things in their house 
that are connected to the internet and it's not just some 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 f- fancy fridge but are there a real world examples that we're missing um in web3 that we f- for some reason don't know about because we're concentrating too much on crypto well i do think that the word crypto uh currency particularly um does a real disservice to web3 because i think that it's um really a bit of a misnomer you know, currency is, is a very specific thing. A currency is designed to be a medium of exchange, a store of value, a unit of account. You know, the U.S. dollar is a currency. The euro is a currency. And I think a lot of people look at the world of crypto and they ask, well, I don't get it. <laughs> Why do we need thousands of crypto currencies? We already have a system with dozens, if not hundreds of fiat currencies issued by governments. Well, because they don't use they don't use it for currency. They just want to make a few quid on the side, isn't that isn't that the reason for most well, people get involved in crypto? Um well that's I mean may, maybe. I mean we, we can we can talk about that in, in a moment. Um but I think that the just the best way to think about digital assets um is basically just as containers for value. So in the same way that uh, like a shipping container can contain, you know, furniture and computers and clothing and bicycles and, you know, God knows what else. Um, a token can, is, is a soft piece of software that can be programmed to contain anything of value. So it can contain a currency or it can contain, um, to your point, sort of an inve- like, um, you know, share in a highly speculative new enterprise, which is, I think, what a lot of crypto assets are, uh, frankly. Like a lot of them are more akin to um, investing into you know, highly speculative startups than, than anything else, right? Mm-hmm. People are doing that because they're hoping to make a quick buck, to your point. Um, but, but the way to think about tokens is these, these open programmable things, right? So in the same way that like a website can contain everything from, you know, a podcast studio, which is what it is right here, um, to, you know, a landing page for my book tour or, you know, where you get the sports scores or whatever, anything. Um, a token can be programmed to represent anything of value. So within the world of Web3 today, tokens are being used to represent money, uh, stocks and bonds, titles and deeds, art, collectibles, um, IP, even votes in elections. And um, that's those are uh, applications and use cases which are very real and are, and are um, being deployed today. So I just think that um, as a level set, you know, the, the term cryptocurrency or even crypto itself, um, I think uh, muddies mm. the water a little bit in terms of what these uh what this specific use case actually is no it's a, it's a very fair point i when i have been researching or reading or occasionally even writing about web3 over the years the u- use cases that have all always surfaced have been things like identification you know secure identification or buying a a concert ticket for example that you know, that was attached to a blockchain, so there, there, there was less chance of fraud. Or I've talked to people in the financial sector who say that they're investigating all sorts of uh, use cases and scenarios for blockchain in financial instruments. I'm still not aware, though, of many, if any, blockchain-backed or even Web3. And, and I, I appreciate you've given a general um, definition of Web3, but let's take blockchain, for example. What services I use um, on a daily, a weekly, a month, or even an annual basis in blockchain? But I'm sure I do. I, I just don't realize it. Well, I mean, that's an interesting point, the last point you made, because there are a lot of um, big companies and banks in particular that are integrating a version of this technology into the back end of, of their business. Um, you know, I think today it was HSBC and yesterday it was JP Morgan. And you hear about all these big banks doing things on blockchains. I mean, most of the blockchains that those big banks um, have been using are, are more, um, they're more akin to like the intranets of the internet age. They're sort of, they're, they resemble open networks, but they're, uh, or they resemble sort of the, the technology, but they are sort of closed off versions. But I think in the same way that, you know, the, that uh, most innovation within the, the web moved from those intranets to into the open web, I think the same will be true here. And in general, I would say that more and more what you're seeing from um, big companies is the adoption of public blockchains. So, for example, like in, in the last couple of months, we've seen uh, PayPal um, announce that it is going to launch a stablecoin on the uh, Ethereum network. So to your point, like what is the what is the product market fit or where is the first killer app for this technology? Um, wh- one of the things where this has had a lot of success, um, remember, tokens are containers for value. So one of the things that everybody wants to have access to is U.S. dollars. So in a sort of uh, twist of irony, 
the one of the first killer apps of, of blockchain technology is actually the US dollar. So stable coins are uh, a kind of asset that are widely used um, all around the world by many different people. In the book, um, in the research for the book, I interviewed an entrepreneur who uh, has a company called CoraPay that operates in Africa. And basically what CoraPay does is helps big companies that have operations in the uh, African continent get money back into the US and US dollars. So these could be companies like Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, whatever, um, who are er earning dollars or earning Naira, in, let's say in Nigeria, and need to move money back into US dollars. The cheapest and fastest way to do that is actually to convert the local currency into a US dollar stablecoin and settle it real time um, in Just US bank. Just for those who aren't aware of it, the, the idea of stablecoin, and we are drifting again back closer to the idea of crypto in the, the sense that many people will know it. But just that idea of a stablecoin, uh, at some level, it sounds a little bit like we're in that movie, The Big Short, with you know Ryan Gosling and, and uh, uh, Steve Carell and all those guys when they're talking about derivatives and they're talking about stores of value that really an industry has come up with kind of out of nowhere which is derivative or based loosely on something else. Now, I'm playing devil's advocate here because I have written before that it is possible to create a store of value, I think, in something if enough people believe in it. But isn't that what we're talking about? We're kind of talking about making something up. Um, well, it it depends which stablecoin we're talking about. But the one that I'm referring to is, is the exact opposite. So like something, so what this company CorePay does is they use a stablecoin called USDC. So USDC is um, a, a project launched by an American company and they issue token, a token called a stablecoin against a dollar held in reserve in a US regulated financial institution. So they have um, transparent um, audit done of all of the assets that they own. So if you own a stable coin, it's backed by dollars held in U.S. dollar bonds or short term deposits held at regulated financial institutions in the U.S. So it's basically the opposite. It's it's not a derivative of value. It's something that's backed dollar for dollar by value, which incidentally is quite different um, from the way things work at an actual bank at an actual bank. Um, for every dollar of deposit, they can create ten dollars of loans. Sure. So when, you, when yeah. you have a dollar in deposit at the bank, it's not actually backed dollar for dollar, which is why if everybody decides to to withdraw all their money at once, banks can fail. Oh no, I, I'm very aware of the irony of of um, and and we often get into this when we hear about debates around the crypto world because the crypto uh, guys did you have a point saying well look at your fiat system that you have and look at the way it's set up. And it's a, it's really a bit of a house of cards. So it's a bit rich for you guys to be telling us that it's all smoke uh, and mirrors. Um, I, I don't I don't necessarily buy into that because I think that there's like, I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, the fractional reserve system. Like that's what I, what I was referring to. Mm. But it is just worth pointing out that um, at least for a lot of these different assets, they're backed, um, they have more collateral uh, than than what's typical in the traditional financial world. But uh, you're right that the conversation has veered back towards financial applications. I wouldn't call this crypto. Like I think you can think of, you know, stablecoin as a container for US dollars. That's all that this is. And it, the container can also contain other things. So there are stable coins that are backed by euros, for example, mm. uh, ones that are backed by gold. And then there are other tokens that are backed by other real world assets or, or things that are not financial at all in nature. So in the research for the book, in fact, I, I talked to um, a young artist in the Philippines. His name is uh, Sevi. And Sevi is a 10 year old boy. He's a talented painter, but he also happens to be autistic. And in the Philippines, um, autism therapy is not something that's covered by the government. And so his parents had to dig deep to cover his um, health care expenses. Um, and so eventually, um, you know, he had to choose which of the therapies he wanted to continue on. So he dropped sports and he dropped gymnastics, but he kept going with art. Now, his art was something that his parents were quite proud of and they shared it online. And much to their surprise, a lot of people wanted to buy a copy of his art. Um, but what he wanted to do was hold on to his art. And his therapist thought that that was a good idea, too. But fortunately, around the time that this happened, his mom um, caught wind of this thing called NFTs, because in the Philippines, there's a very big sort of burgeoning Web3 community. Now, most people think of NFTs as these sort of speculative investments, right, that have gone up in value and gone down in value. But what an NFT is simply is, is a way to create a unique digital version of an asset. So that digital that asset could be 
anything, including a piece of art from a 10 year old autistic boy. So Sevi, um, much to his parents' surprise, um, started to sell a couple pieces. And we're not talking about big money here, you know, a few hundred bucks here and there, mostly friends and family and things like that. Um, but he also caught the attention of some collectors in the United States and uh, eventually ended up going to New York and presenting at a big arts fair. So in the end, you know, Sevi and his family have maybe made $10,000 in a couple of years from, from this, which is a drop in the bucket compared to the whole NFT market. But for mm. an average but for an average Filipino family who needs to pay for the health care of their 10 year old boy, it's life changing. So what's the lesson here? Well, the lesson is that, you know, um, in a traditional like in the traditional web, um, you know, we could have uh, he could have shared his art on Facebook and Instagram, which is what he did and reach a much broader audience. And, and that's really important. Right. The, the previous era of the web, what we call Web 2, sort of democratized access to publishing so you could share information. But what Web 3 does is it empowers people with a new toolkit to earn money and to move and store value in ways that were not possible before. And so the story of Sevi is something that is not replicable for every child who draws a painting, obviously, but it is something that every creator, every uh, creator can harness this toolkit as a way to you know connect more deeply with fans and to actually mm -hmm. earn a living from their work. Do you know what? I'm glad Sevi made a few quid out of NFTs because I'm looking at... Uh, some of the people who invested in the uh, Board Ape Yacht Club uh, NFTs, for example, and I think who is it? Was it um, Justin Bieber? Did he pay 1.3 million for one of them, and it's now worth I don't know 100 grand, something like that? Um, I do sometimes wonder what the purchaser of Beeple's 69 million dollar uh, artwork. I believe it was Christie's. I think it was Sotheby's. I think it was Christie's. Um, as an NFT, I do wonder whether they think they could redeem that for $69 million. And I'm also, I'm, I'm, I follow English Premier League football and those clubs, like many other sports organizations, they went through a wave of selling NF NFTs. And I think most people who bought them, you know, $50 ago, probably worth about a, a, a dollar now. But I think I take your general point that maybe the winners and the losers, we shouldn't focus on that. It's the it's the medium, it's the platform, the emergence of that. Is that your point? Um, yeah, well, I mean, on your point about the on the, uh, the art and the price and the value of art, there's, um, what's that joke about uh, Zhu Enlai, the, the former premier of China, when asked about the impact of the French Revolution, he said, it's, it's too early to tell. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that, um, look, I mean, I'm not trying to make light of the fact that, um, you know, people speculated and, and lost money on something but um, well they're they're the very last people in the world that we're going to feel sorry for if you, if you spent 150 grand or 500 grand or a million dollars on a board a yacht club nft chances are you probably had that money to spend yeah i hope so. i certainly hope i certainly hope that that's true um no but i think that uh, the point is that um you know nfts are a way for us to create um digital versions mm. of unique assets, but also to program those assets with intelligence. And I think that's something that is also lost on a lot of people. So in the discussion around NFTs and the billions of dollars of money that was made and lost in, in speculating on the sale of these assets, what's lost in that discussion is the fact that over 300 NFT projects created at least $1 million of secondary revenue for the original creators. So here's what I mean by that. So if you're a traditional artist today and you sell a painting for let's say $500, like you're a starving artist, and then you know you keep on working and then you hit it big and a couple of years later, uh, your art is worth, uh, that piece, same piece is worth a million bucks or something. You don't participate on the difference between 500 and a million, right? You don't get paid a royalty or something for the secondary sale. Um, but with an NFT, you can program the asset to in, to automatically make a payment to the original creator because what a digital asset has is clear provenance we know who the original creator is so there have been 300 nft projects where the secondary and third tertiary sale of those assets has actually created a flow of revenue back to the original creator of over a million dollars so why is that important well we live in an era today where creators know less about how their content is being consumed and on average are getting paid less than ever before. And I think that culture as an industry needs a new business model. And I actually think that the threat of AI 
or I should I shouldn't call it a threat, but the emergence of AI promises to disrupt the model for creators even more. There are a lot of business people who think that um, you know AI can write scripts and um, do visual effects and maybe even be actors. Once we get digital twins with the likeness of the actor, we don't need the actual actor. It's a whole other podcast right there. But it yeah, is, it is. But the question is, um, how are we going to? So in, in that kind of world, how do we ensure that creators um, get compensated and that we're able to, you know, continue to pay people who create culture? Because frankly, I think that without it, you know, the world's a much duller place. Well, we can actually learn a lesson from this example that I've just provided about the 300 projects. So right now, the question around AI is that all of this IP is going into these models, but nobody knows, um, or rather I should say, uh, there's no clear way of, of, of uh, attributing the ownership of that IP and ensuring that the creator gets paid fairly. But if the IP was in the container, was in a token, and we were able to um, create a payment every time that that IP was used in a, model, in a model to create something of value, then we could ensure that creators get paid fairly. Like you can ask ChatGPT um, to write a write a you know a script in the as if you were Chris Rock about you know the Irish uh, technology podcast or something mm. <laughs> and it yeah. would, and it would do it and how don't think it, don't think i haven't done that alex well well the question is so it knows so it would know about the irish independent but it would also mm. know about Chris Rock, and it would be able to put those two things together. And let's say, I mean, this is an unlikely scenario, but let's say that someone picked that up and ran it as a show or something, <laughs> and it made a bunch of money. It would be really just important that the creators of the IP that went into creating that um, output actually got paid fairly, right? And so there are ways to do this, and we know this from the world of Web3. So it's an important lesson to learn about um, not confusing the first sort of uh, example of a, a technology with its end product. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we know from prior eras as well. I mean, anybody who's on the show who's older than 35 probably remembers logging on to the web for the first time in the 1990s um, and remembers it not as a very intuitive experience and, and probably found that the content on the internet was not particularly um, high quality, right? And um, of course, the web uh, matured and scaled and became a tool for business and for uh, cultural creation and innovation. And, and now is the dominant you know, platform for, <laughs> for, the, for the entire economy, pretty much. Well, it's going to be fascinating to see how all this uh, develops, Alex. And uh, just a reminder that your book is called Web3, Charting the Internet's Next Economic and Cultural frontier and uh, i presume you can also get it for kindle and other electronic formats as well as uh, in hard copy yes, um, there's, yes. An audio, there's an audio book as well um which fortunately for the listeners i did not narrate <laughs> i was a professional <laughs> a professional narrator who uh who did the did it and he's he did a terrific job okay so it won't be rude then to put it on 1.5x or, or 2x when i'm listening to it alex tapscott uh, again your book is called web3 charting the internet's next economic and cultural frontier and thank you very much for joining us on the big tech show today and that is all we have time for <laughs>